Hello and welcome to Pro Wrestling Inside and Out. We are going to look at what they would call booking in the territorial system. Then we're going to kind of look at what they call writers today. I don't even think they have bookers anymore. I don't think they're called bookers. No. Uh, I believe they're called show producers, aren't they? Producers, uh, agents, uh, yeah. There's all kinds of terms for them, but they don't do the job that the booker did. Uh, let's look at let's look at and, and tear down uh, a booking for a territory. Booking kind of started with the Gold Dust Trio. They were really the first people that actually took and put a storyline within a show. Uh, they kind of uh, changed They changed the wrestling business of what it was. Uh, and and they changed it into a spectacle, not just one match, because you've got to remember we, we're doing a world champion series, and we see guys having, what, three-hour matches. There were one match on these cards. Well, these three, the Gold Dust Trio decided that, you know, the matches don't need to be that long. We need to go 10, 15, 20 minutes, and we we, we need to have return matches. Well, you know, and what happened was to me, this is what happened. And now this is, I can see this happen. They went to a show one time and a guy got through out of the ring and he, he knocked himself out and the guy got counted out and the people went nuts and they're sitting back in the back going, you know, we're in, we're in Nebraska, Omaha next week, man, that thing got over pretty good. You think we could ask Joe to fall out of there again and knock himself out again down there? Because they're sitting there thinking that got over. Yeah. And I believe that in their process, they said, this would be great. We could make return matches. We could do all. Very smart people. Go to Trio, very smart people. Now, after they did that, there were several other people that picked up on it. Yeah. They were not the only, they, they were the first, but they wasn't the last of it. They wasn't the last of that. Now, they're the ones that gave us all the uh, the, the job guy. You know, they, they're the ones that gave us all of that terminology because they used it to send the Western uh, Union because that's how they sent their finishes. They sent them through Western Union. I mean, that's the only way to send finishes back in those days. <laughs> Why did they do that? Why didn't they just send one of the boys that was going to be working the show doing that? Well, I guess it was uh, better to send telegraph than smoke signals. It's probably their way of verifying so that if the finish was changed, some guy couldn't just claim, oh, well, I got I got confused. <laughs> you know, you got it writing right there. There's no no backing out of that. And everything was in code, mm -hmm. and that's where the code come from. That's where the wrestling code come from. And by the way, when people call people job guys, it shouldn't have never been derogatory. Maybe they should have never told a wrestler what a job guy was. Yeah. And maybe that was the problem. They uh, they told it, but now well, it, it had a different connotation back then too. You yes, know, doing the job just meant you were going to lose that night. Yeah, uh, and, and really, when you became a part of the territory, you actually put someone over. You was not a at the point you either put somebody over, or you went over. Yep, one of the two. Yep. Uh, you did not do a job for someone, but for some reason, the wrestlers decided, oh, that was oh, you're doing a job. No, you're putting a guy over. You're part of the territory. You're going to be here at least twelve weeks. You know, back then you you were going to at least be there twelve weeks unless you got over. But let's talk. Let's talk about running. Let's look at the booking, and I'm going to ask you this question: What is the difference at this point today between the Booker and what they're doing today, writing television? What 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 is the difference? What do you see as the difference? Well. Uh... Writers uh, really do not have to. Um, uh, they they can write whatever they want to. They do not have to have results. Bookers absolutely had to have results. And being that a lot of their towns was every week, they could get you know instantaneous feedback on what they were doing. And the bottom line is, if you want to stay Booker, you better put some butts in that seat. You better know what you're doing. You better bring in the right talent. A lot of, uh, and Michael Barr was asking a question, uh, were there good bookers? The bookers could have come up with good, some good angles. It, it's, it, it goes further than that. It was a very uh, a collection of very talented people that they had with them, putting together, just like a football team, putting together a great crew. 
case in point, Bill Dundee putting together a great crew to go to Mid-South with the Midnight Express, Jim Cornette, Buddy Landell. So uh, it, it was, it was, uh, they, the, the Booker was more, uh, it was sure he came up with some great ideas, but you had to have great people, great talent to execute those ideas. Uh, Buddy Fuller was one of the best of going in and building, uh, building up the territory. He would go in because he sold, I don't know how many territories over and over again in some cases, but he would have great talent, know, knew exactly what they were doing when they got out there. And yes, then he could put them in those great angles, but lots of times it was depending on who you had in the angle that was the most important part. You could do, you couldn't do that with people that were, you know, <laughs> nobody knew. They had to be over. So it was a very, very important. And like I said, it was, it was, let me try something here. It doesn't work. You've got to change it because behind the booker is the man signing the checks and putting the money up. You don't produce you and your crew is gone. They're gone. Whereas the writers of today, there, there is no incentive for them to excel. They write it, they please the boss and that's all they need to do. Pleasing the fans. That's not, that's just secondary. Jack? Well, you know, back in the day, uh, to be a booker, uh, to uh, be an assistant booker, you had to have practical experience with the industry because we're not like anything else. You know, you can't equate us to Hollywood writers or uh, a novelist or anything like that. If you haven't experienced that at some level of what we do, it's hard to understand what you're doing. And I think that is one of the biggest things that's missing today is they're hiring these people from Hollywood. Uh, you, know, you know, Vince made that point years ago. He didn't want experienced people. He wanted fresh ideas. Well, fresh ideas is what's got us where we're at because those people don't have practical experience. They don't understand. They're in there envisioning guys doing things that are not physically possible to actually do. And bookers, myself, you know, and, and people, you know, that, that's experienced, we know what the limitations are. We know how to bring out the best in certain people. We know how to work with their strengths. We know how to hide their weaknesses. These guys just throw stuff out there, and if you can do it, you can do it, and if you can't, then they get blamed for it, not the writers. You know, and, and that's where, to me, is, is the biggest disconnect between uh, writers and bookers of, 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 of the day uh, is that they just, they've never been in there. They've never took a bump. They've never counted three on anybody. Uh, and, and I don't know, I, I mean, I'm sure they're at the show, but they don't even talk to the guys. Yeah. You know, Roman Reigns is one of those few guys that has Vince's ear. And I think he has the best stuff going on today because he doesn't go through the writers. I don't have to clear anything. He sits down with Vince, and they come up with all the stuff, you know, between him and Paul Heyman, who I think Paul Heyman should be the guy that's over your entire product up there. Between him and Michael Hayes, they know everything about this industry. Uh, and if you're going to have writers, then everything should be filtered through them. Why that's not happening is beyond me. I don't know. Yeah, you know, and, and, and the thing about booking – was if if you were a smart booker back in the territory days, you would actually watch the matches that were being done. Yep. If you were a smart booker. Yep. Now, if you wasn't a smart booker, and and let's say Nick Goulas came to you and said, "Hey, uh, Lynn, did you watch that match between the, the interns and uh, uh, let's say Jackie and uh, Don Fargo?" Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't watch. Well, well, then what happened in that match? And if you didn't know what happened in that match, Nick Goulas was going to say, well, what happened was is those thousands of people is going to be here. They're not going to be here next week because that match sucked. Yep. And there, people are not going to buy their a buy a ticket to come back and see that crap. And so he would tell you right up front that this would be on a Saturday. He said, next Saturday morning, you better shoot some angle. On Saturday morning, you better shoot something to make the people buy a ticket. Exactly. If not, I'm getting rid of you, and I'm bringing in uh, uh, Tom uh, uh, Tom just, Ernesto. Or I'll do it myself. Yeah. Or I'll do it myself. Yeah. They would not take 
uh, things being bad. Jim Barnett would not take things to a bad. People, you know, Ole can take all the credit he wants to, but if Ole wasn't successful at what he did, he would have got rid of him. And there was a time that Ole was not successful in booking Atlanta. He did good from 1977, I believe, until the end of 1979. Things started going down. This reason they were that only left, not because he was doing such a great job, because it was business was bad, because only had done three years worth of booking. After three years, you're going to run out of ideals. You're yep. going to start repeating yourself. Uh, Mid South Wrestling did that. Uh, Bill Dundee started repeating himself uh, in in the Mid South Wrestling, and that's the reason they started making a booking committee. Uh, they didn't want to get rid of Bill because that was the biggest uh, year that uh, Bill Watts ever had. But the booking of the shows was from show to show. There is no writer that ever sits and probably watches a match. I, I doubt very seriously they're sitting and watching their matches. Yeah. And they don't even they wouldn't know what a good match was to begin with. Yeah. But back in the day, if if that first guy in that first match, and let's say it was Wendell Cooley and he was getting over with a booker, would go, hmm, man, he's getting a good reaction. Well, he would get he would get on there in, in the next morning, and he'd start riding down with Wendell Cooley. All right, let's let's put him. He's on the first match. Let's let's throw him on the third match. All right, and we'll see let's see how he gets over in that third match. Man, he got over pretty good. Okay, all right, he's, I'm gonna move him into the fourth match. Uh, and before you know it, he's on the semi main event because he got over. He was getting over with the fans, not because of anything the Booker was doing, because of what Wendell Cooley was doing right. and how he got himself over. And it's very important if you're a wrestler, make sure you know how to get yourself over, because the booker can only do so much. He can he can tell you what you got to do, but you still got to be able to get yourself over. And that the that is the the difference between bookers, to me, and writers. I mean, that's just uh, you know, <laughs> Dutch Mantel was one of the greatest bookers of all time, because he did that. That's how he watched it, and he would change stuff overnight. He said, man, I had this road run out for TV, but I ain't doing that. That didn't get over, but this did, so this is what's going to take this place for that. I remember, I remember Dutch talking about uh, WWE years ago, uh, contacted him about coming in to help with the booking, and uh, they wanted him to write out a six-week scenario, and he said, well, I can do that. He said, but don't mean anything. And the secretary that he was talking to said, what do you mean? He said, well, if I write out six weeks worth of stuff and the first week is okay, but the second week don't get over at all, he said, then whatever I was planning on doing ain't going to be done anymore. I'm changing everything. Yeah. And she said, well, that's not the way we do things here. And he said, well, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> exactly <laughs> that is, right. It is true. Yep, you know, exactly booking right. was done. I'm going to tell you, booking was better in the 70s. If you go back and look at what was done in the 1970s, and I'm talking about up to 1979, for some reason in the 80s, it's like the promoters just lost their minds. Yeah. I don't know what happened to them, but they did not spend the time. 1979, booking, I can remember Hulk Hogan being Sterling Golden, had the golden squeeze, and if he got out of it, he got $1,000. Yep. The superstar – did the Cobra hold. And if you get it out of that, you got a thousand dollars. Two thousand dollars. Austin Idol put you in the figure for a lot of luck. You get a thousand. Three guys doing the Las same thing. Las Vegas leg lock. Yes. Las Vegas <laughs> leg lock. You're exactly Three right. Three guys doing the same thing. Now, where was Jim Barnett? Where was the people saying, Why are you doing this? Why are we doing three things? It's the same exact angle. It's the same kind of thing that we just do. Why are we doing this? And and if you you can see the progression and what happens to Atlanta because of that. Yeah. Uh, plus, Ole Anderson turning babyface was not a great idea, right. uh, by the way. It was never a good idea. Uh, him and Lars kind of helped kill that territory. Uh, bad matches. Horrible matches. And and I'd say a lot about Ole. Ole I, was, I was there. I'll agree. <laughs> they were, but, but the problem was they were they really hated each other, so they were really out going out there, and you couldn't sell it because they couldn't sell nothing. They just stand there because they'd hit each other so hard. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, there's you should make contact, but you can try to kill somebody. Now they were yep. trying to kill each other. Yep. Um, we're, we, let's get some. Uh, there's a couple of people who asked some questions, and then we'll we'll move on because we don't want this uh, video to be too long. 
Uh, Booker's, uh, uh, Sturt Kemp said, Booker's were never friends with the boys. That's very important. Very important because, you know, you don't want to be, be – just because you're the friend of somebody to book them on the main event and they don't draw. I have I, – I've made this statement today to the promoter that I have a lot of friends that are wrestlers, but I don't book very many of them. And it's 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 important. Okay, uh, Michael Barr said, did a good booker or a promoter pay attention to what was going on in his wrestler's angles? Yes. You had to. That was your job. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Richard Hood said, Brent, if Ole tells it, he was the greatest booker. Ole was good. Ole did some great stuff. But also, as good of a stuff that he did in the 80s, he did even worse. As good as he did, by the time the 80s come along, he was doing some horrible things. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll say Ole was one of my favorite bookers. Now, was yeah. he the greatest booker? No, he wasn't the greatest booker. But I still emulate and, and copy a lot of the stuff that he does and, and the way he delivered himself. I still do that. But at the same time, Ole gives nobody any other credit. Yeah. Ron West was there as well. He came up with a lot of the finishes that y'all saw, a lot of the angles that you saw, he came up with them. Uh, Gene Anderson, while he was there, came up with a bunch of stuff that you saw. Uh, when Gary Hart was in in that territory, Gary Hart came up with what was going on uh, for his part of this stuff. So it wasn't always Ole that took care of everything and handled everything. He usually took care of himself, but that was about the extent of it. Because I remember he said, okay, I, Ronnie, I'll take care of mine and Ivan's and Tommy Rich's and Wahoo's main event. All right, you take care of the rest of them. That was, that's the way it was done. Dad would most of the time was the assistant booker for him. If he wasn't him, Bob Armstrong or someone else was there uh, that, that helped him. But he never will give people credit for that for some reason. Not, never. They were always the S. <laughs> Everybody was. Everybody they did ever come in contact with. And I'm not saying Ole wasn't great because he was. Great wrestler, great booker. But as good as he was in the, in the, in the late 70s was as bad as he was in the 80s. He did some horrible stuff uh, right before he closed and everything. I mean, it was some bad booking. Uh, Michael Barr asked the question, is that is that the good bookers had good ideals and altered the matches where they were not the same week after week? But yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you had to do that. People weren't going to buy the pay to see the same thing week after week. Um, <laughs> Richard had said, remember, only got rid of Hulk Hogan. Well, now, at, Hulk Hogan was bad at the time. Sterling Golden was horrible. Yep. Yeah, he was not wrong for getting rid of him. And if he had not gotten rid of him, he never would have went to AWA. He never would have gotten noticed by Sylvester Stallone. He never would have done that movie. And that movie was the hinge point of, of Hogan's career. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I only done the entire industry a favor by, fi by firing him at the time. <laughs> Yeah, he did. Well, now he when it first did, he sent him to he sent him to Southeastern Championship Wrestling. That was, that was he sent him there first, and then I think he left from there and went to uh, I don't know where. Maybe he went to Vern from there. I'm not for sure, but uh, maybe maybe because he'd already been to Memphis. Hadn't he? he he probably at one point he did go to uh, work for Vince McMahon Senior. That might have been when he was when he managed, did, and that's when he was time. managed. Yeah, that was when he was managed by um, uh, Freddie Blassie. Who is the best booker today? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and say Jack the Bomber Lord. I think he might <laughs> well, be the only booker that's left out there in the rest of the No, world. I'm going to tell you, uh, the guy uh, the guy that's over MLW, uh, Court Count, Court Byer, what, I can't think of his name. Uh, he does an excellent job up there. He's an actual booker. Uh, I love the the storylines, the angles that they do up there. I don't, I don't like the language. I've said that many times. But the product is solid. And, uh, you know, if you're not watching that, then give it a shot. I mean, you know, fingers in your ears if it offends you for language. But, but man, it's a good product. Richard Hood said Ole was making three-quarters of a million in the 70s, been his booker and worker. I, I would believe that. Uh, I would, because uh, he was probably making 3000 a week just uh, in his in, in the main event magic. Because remember, there wasn't but 14 guys on the card, maybe sometimes 12. Well, you know, the, the guys had to work for it. Uh, Charles said this. He said, Ole asked me, who do you think was running the wrestling? I thought he was going to fall out of his chair backwards when I said Paul Jones. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Ole was a booker. Yes, he booked the shows. But he did not book the towns. He did not 
take care of the newspaper advertising for the towns. He did not check up in the towns. He did not take care of the TVs and make sure the, the tapes got to the towns. He did not make sure the insurance was paid for. He didn't do any of those things. He absolutely was only the booker. He did not run the wrestling company. Now, he was a booker and he booked the show, but he did not run the company for a long time. Jim Barnett, Ronnie West, Bobby Simmons, those were the three people for a long period of time that ran the actual day-to-day -day operations of Georgia Championship Wrestling. Ole did not do that. I know he tries to tell people that he did that, but Ole did not. He booked the territory. He took care of the talent. That's all he did. And in, in that time, he did not run. Now, when, when he did finally take over, we know what happened because he didn't understand it because he was never taught how to do that stuff. Right. So he was lost. He was absolutely lost. These were the exact words Ole would say. The, ta the TV tapes never got to the towns, to the TVs. And he asked this question to Jack uh, Briscoe or Jerry Briscoe. Well, who took care of that? Ronnie took care of that. Well, on Friday, we don't have nothing booked for this day. Who who? Who booked the spot shows? Who booked it? Ronnie booked the spot shows. So he didn't understand what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis because he didn't even go to the office. He, I don't even think he even knew who worked in the office. I don't think he ever went to it. So Ole was great, great booker, but he never ran a wrestling company until he took over from Jim Barnett, and it did not last. Uh, it did not last at all. And, and I love Ole Anderson. I respect Ole Anderson. But when he says he ran a wrestling company, he ran it at the end from 1983 to 1984. One year, one year, the company kind of went belly up. And, and it would have went belly up regardless of Vince McMahon or not. Business was bad uh, for them at that time. As Ole would tell people, I can lose money with or without you. That was his <laughs> statement. <laughs> That's what... If you enjoyed this video, give us the big thumbs up. Subscribe to the page. Send all your letters, hate letters, of what I said about Ole Anderson to Rodney West and Jack Lord. <laughs> Go one step further. Hit that notification bell. And um, share the video. Thank there you so you much. And we'll see you on the next video.